Hello and good evening to all our guests for this evening. I take this opportunity to extend a warm welcome to all of you at the National Conference on Trial by Media, Issues, Challenges and the Road Ahead. The event is hosted by MP Govind Nambia uh, Foundation and Rotrack Club of Noida Youth. Rotrack Club of Noida Youth is a service organization affiliated to the Rotary International and working under the aegis of Rotary Club of Kaushambi. Media plays a vital role in moduling the opinion of society 
and it is capable of changing the whole viewpoint through which people perceive various events. Heinous crimes must be condemned and the media would be justified in calling for the perpetrators to be punished in accordance with the law. However, the media cannot usurp the functions of judiciary and deviate from objective and unbiased reporting. While a media shackled by government regulations is unhealthy for democracy, the implications of continued accountability are even more damaging. Steps needs to be taken in order to prevent media trials from eroding the civil rights of citizens, whereby the media has a clearer definition of their rights and duties, and the courts are given the power to punish those who disregard them. To deliberate upon the issue, which has been widely discussed in the recent times, we are extremely thankful to the panel of speakers that we have for today for accepting a humble invitation and agreeing to talk to all of us on the issue. I'm extremely delighted and thankful to Sri Kalishwaram Rajji, Advocate, Supreme Court of India, and Sri Shatya Prakash Ji, Legal Editor for the Tribune, for being with us today. I now invite my co-host, the talented Opika Nambiar, Advocate, Madras High Court, to speak to you about the MP Govinda Nambiar Foundation and carry forward the event from here. Thank you so much, Karan. Am I audible? Yes, Gopika. Yeah. Very good evening to one and all. Uh, thank you so much for the generous introduction, Karan, and also about and also for elaborating the topics that we're going to discuss today. So I'll first uh, tell all of you about the MP Govinda Nambiar Foundation. So the MP Govinda Nambiar Foundation is a trust which is started uh, in the memory of my late grandfather, Advocate Sri MP Govinda Nambiar. So he had an extensive uh, practice in civil and labor law in the Malabar region of Kerala. He was in fact uh, one of the um, first juniors of uh, Justice V. R. Krishnayar, former judge, Supreme Court of India. And in fact, uh, in uh, Justice Krishnayar's own words, one of his most favorite juniors. And uh, later on, uh, my grandfather started his independent practice and he had a battery of juniors, many of whom are uh, reputed lawyers across the country. And uh, one a common thing which uh, everyone who knew my grandfather uh, tells about him is that he was a personification of the adage, work is worship. So he was completely dedicated towards his work. Um, it was his passion. It was his life. And uh, he was not doing it for money. He was doing it because he really, um, he, was, he was completely dedicated to it and he really enjoyed it. So, um, you know, in fact, I would say that um, the manner uh, in which, uh, you know, he passed away is, uh, I would say, poetically is a fitting tribute to uh, the man himself because he passed away while arguing a case uh, in court. He suffered an attack of brain hemorrhage while he was arguing a case in court. Uh, and so it is in his honor that uh, we uh, founded the MP Govinda Nambiar uh, Foundation uh, in the year 2012. And basically, the aim of the foundation is to encourage um, budding young lawyers, law students um, to contribute towards the development of law and also to um, you know, conduct various charitable activities. So we've been organizing moot court competitions, national level moot court competitions, along with Government Law College Pondicherry in uh, the previous years. Um, and it was met with great response. Uh, there were law students from across the country who came in. Uh, but this year, of course, due to COVID-19, we are not able to organize such uh, an event. But we thought we'd make use of the digital platform. And uh, we were able to partner with the Rotract uh, Club of Noida, the youth club. And uh, I must profusely thank Karan and the entire team of Rotract because they've been doing the bulk of the hard work from designing the posters uh, to sending uh, to replying to the registration mails and everything. So I must profusely thank the entire team. And uh, I, I sincerely thank the panelists, uh, Mr. Satya Prakash sir and Mr. Kalishwan Raj sir for accepting our invitation and uh, being here today. So without much further ado, I'll just uh, uh, you know introduce the topic again. So the topic that we have uh, selected today is uh, trial by media, issues, challenges, and the road ahead. All of us know about the current situation which uh, we are going through and also about uh, the controversy that uh, various uh, media, uh, various sections of the media are facing because, uh, of, because of various uh, reasons. 
and we know that the issue is serious because the attorney general of india has submitted uh, before the honorable supreme court that he is concerned about um, various sections of the media uh, the 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 you know virtual trial that they conduct and uh, also about the fact that it influences public perception and also the mind of judges themselves who are hearing these subjudized matters and uh, therefore there is a need to talk about this issue and um, therefore i invite uh, advocate kalishan raj uh, supreme court of india advocate supreme court of india to share his views his insights on this issue over to you sir uh, a very warm good evening uh, uh, ms gobiga uh mr satya prakash mr kumar karan and uh, my dear uh, friends who are watching this program which i believe is also running live in youtube first of all i should congratulate the organizers and the collaboration in making this event possible uh ms gobiga has such very briefly about uh, advocate govinda nambiar the very remembrance of advocate govinda nambiar is a remembrance of a, a great legacy which in turn will rather remind us of the values which the profession should maintain which the judicial system should maintain which the society at large should maintain and once you take the topic of media trial it is appropriate quite appropriate that we are reminding ourselves not only just about the values which the media should have we are reminding the values which the judiciary should have which the society should have which each and every one of us should have in the modern context of media trial therefore i find that there is a fine linkage uh, between the occasion and the topic which the organizers have selected for that then i am so happy that i find mr satyaprakash ji also here i have seen him running across the supreme court sometimes but we have not uh, we have probably never uh, talked to each other though we might have seen i remember his a uh, handsome face and the kind of you know the charm which he maintains despite his journalistic efforts hectic journalism and all that i have read him when he wrote about the sting operations and the uh, his report about the custodial deaths and all and he belongs to a very reputed newspaper of the country namely the tribune so i'm so happy that he also will be rather supplementing uh, meaningfully to my continuing legal education now coming to the topic i think i can consume some uh, 20 25 minutes for that uh, for the purpose uh, the topic as i said is very significant at the same time it is extremely uh, complex as well media trail we We talk about it very, very emphatically, very, very passionately nowadays because it's a reality. It's a reality which touches not just the complainant and the accused in a given case. It's a reality that has started to have its systemic impacts in judicial, upon the judges, upon the lawyers, upon the society. and upon the entire time in which we are living of course there is a question of issue of media trail there is also a, a separate a rather distinct issue of hate speech true that these are two different topics doctrinally but there may be instances where the issue of hate speech also can have an overlapping effect on trial by the media i can see the trial by the media uh, sometimes get accelerated by hate speech as well which in turn can have the effect of enhancing the toxic effects of media trial so that also is something which we may have to slightly you know advert to in our deliberations 
questions will arise whether we have a sufficient legal mechanism to deal with it to deal with the menace of media trade we have our reservations about it there may be certain plus points uh which may be emanating from the trial by the media or rather the vigilance which the media shows but the vigilance of the media should not be rather confused with trial by the media vigilance shown by the media in human rights issues in criminal trials even in constitutional issues may be a positive thing whereas when media takes the role of adjudicator as it very often happens not just in certain celebrity cases but even in almost all localized local issues where some trial is involved some some culpability is involved in the country that is really a matter of concern you know all the times it was usually to say that in a criminal trial the procedure itself could become the punishment because there is a long trial long investigation long prosecution bail jail everything ultimately the trial uh, ends in arguments then conviction or acquittal then again an appeal or revision sometimes a special review petition before the supreme court it takes decades and decades even for culmination of a prosecution whatever be its result so it is rightly said that in criminal trial criminal cases the process itself often becomes the punishment that is how the adversarial system is now added to that because the process becomes punishment because the litigant whether the complainant or the accused we have to spend money we have to engage a lawyer we have to spend a lot of time we have to spend the energy and also we have to undergo the trauma the mental trauma of prosecution especially for the accused and even for the complainant sometimes in certain cases especially the uh, sexual offenses and all even the complainant may be undergoing a trauma this is how we say this is why we say that the process itself becomes a punishment in criminal trials added to that is the issue of trial by the media now the trial begins before the actual trial in court and that trial has a lot of things to do with your dignity your individuality your privacy your autonomy and all that in itself becomes another punishment apart from the formal process in the court this is a new generation issue this is a uh, an issue of the modern times and the digitalized media the television social media and all as to the problem we are all digital we are all digital beings our existence is so closely connected with the digital era everybody is a digital individual it enhances the scope of and potential of the media trail which in turn will affect each and every person in the society and i should also think that it is not just in criminal trials or criminal prosecution that the trial by the media happens even in other cases though we don't use that uh, phrase called trial by the media to other adjudications it's a fact that even in constitutional adjudication media's influence is a reality it happens even in constitutional adjudication in fact uh, lord mansfield who tried a criminal case decades centuries ago had occasion to talk about how the media tried to or the letters and the newspapers of that time that was a judgment reported in r versus wilkie 1770 their lord mansfield said court and courting i pass over many anonymous letters i have received those in print are public and some of them have been brought judicially before the court moreover whoever the writers are they take the wrong way i will do my duty unaided 
this was a 70 this this fight took place in a 1770 judgment when there were no television when there was no social media when there were not even newspapers as which uh, in the in the manner in which we are having uh, uh, them today even during that all period trial by the media was a reality and mind this passage by mansfield was extracted by a judge of the kerala high court in the year 2004 which was 2003 2004 when he was making a constitutional adjudication over the right of the coca cola coca cola plant to extract ground water from a panchayat in kerala where the constitutional issues or rather the fundamental right issues of the general public was raised to have water water level kept intact or to prevent exploitation of ground water therefore it was precisely a constitutional case which the judge was deciding but there were a lot of hue and cry lot of deliberations discourses in the media in favor of and against the parties to the litigation and therefore this uh, passage by lord mansfield was extracted referred to by the judge of the high court who in fact was deciding a repetition a constitutional case the point is therefore the the menace of trial by the media need not be limited to criminal prosecution it can also have impact in other adjudications which may affect the rights of the citizens in varied ways this is a submission which i wanted to make now coming to the major chunk of uh, criminal trials we know that we have the adversarial system the advantage of the adversarial system is that the prosecution as well as the defense are treated equally a judge is an impartial umpire who has to decide it on the basis of evidence and the legal points placed before the before the court but the disadvantage of adversarial system is rather that the judge doesn't go to the venue generally and see the versions he doesn't take evidence from the public or from the venue or from the persons connected with the alleged incident that doesn't happen in adversarial system this is the reason why uh, the british marxist terry eagleton has famously said that i am again quoting court court rooms like novels blur the distinction between fact and fiction the jury judges not on the facts but between rival versions of them so it is not the facts which gets adjudicated it is the prosecution's version of the, on of the facts and the defense version of the fact this is why famous philosopher charles taylor said a little a criminal trial is according to him a zero sum game where the court says either a is correct or b is correct that is to say whether i either a has committed the offense or he is innocent not otherwise so this is the limitation of criminal trial in adversarial system there was a court goes by evidence and the legal points raised before the court now when trial by the media happens even this limited stream of adjudicative process gets contaminated by various external outfits versus different other versions which may not be even supported by crucial concrete legal evidence but may reflect certain public opinion very abstractly and vaguely 
but it's a fact that there is public opinion which gets reinstated and uh, reflected again and again through the telecast and through the pub other publication. One study even said that cel in celebrity crimes, because of media trail, the conviction rate is relatively high for multiple reasons. A judge may take that a celebrity who is supposed to be a model uh, should not have been uh, rather uh, done this or that. A judge may even take, may have a particular view on the celebrity. The judge also is a human being. A judge may sometimes try to keep in par with what the public feels about the crime and about the celebrity, especially after the so-called alleged crime. And the judge may in turn try to uh, have his views, either in concern with the public's view, or at least he may try to avoid a view which goes diametrically opposite to the public view at large. These are all the perils of media trade. The problem is, therefore, there is a requirement to protect the right of the complainant. And it's equally important to protect the right of the accused in a criminal trial. Very many versions or rather observations made during the commentary when a telecast happens with respect to a crime occurred, especially when it say it's a sensational crime, are sheer instances of contempt. Apart from being just you know generic subjudice, those are, in, those are instances of contempt. Those interfere with the judicial procedure. The legal process that happens in court. But generally the court doesn't take each and every telecast. It's practically impossible for, the, for any court to do that either. That even derails the court from the main track of adjudication in the given criminal case. Recently, a plea was raised before the Bombay High Court with a contention that even the publications of obstructing administration of justice in pending cases should be taken within the ambit of contempt by extending it, by extending the publication, by extending the scope of the offense to the time during which a registration of FIR happens. The, 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 according to the plea, the moment the FIR is registered and when investigation, no trial, when the investigation happens, there has to be restrictions on the uh, media's power to report it. Because even during investigation, the trial starts not in the court, but in television. So there is a kind of breach of peace when this premature in uh, trials happens in television, a tele-trial, even prior to the investigation, even before the actual prosecution, even before the actual uh, kind of trial happening in the formal court. Therefore, the plea in Bombay High Court said that that kind of reporting, which starts with the registration of FIR, should be taken to the ambit of trial by the media and especially the contempt law. May, uh, particularly the criminal contempt coming within the ambit of Section 3.2 of the Contempt of Court Act. That is yet to be adjudicated by the Bombay High Court as I understand it. The point is the trial, media trial vicariously poses issues relating to me media's own freedom. There is a widespread thinking in the society now, and even among judges, 
that this is if this freedom is to be regulated there has to be some kind of external regulation which is actually very dangerous to the freedom of the press and to the liberty at large of each and every citizen that's the reason why during the hearing of sudarshan tv where i am also appearing for one of the interveners justice chandrajyot said that the censorship or any interdiction on the media freedom on the right to telecast will be taken will be used only as the last resort his lordship used the word uh, it is like the mis like a missile so it's not so easy to curtail a media because there is something uh, more crucial more foundational at stake namely the liberty in such situations another matter came up before the kerala high court despite the fact that there was a judgment by the supreme court on media freedom in sahara 2012 and another full bench judgment uh, by the kerala high court in sudin case 2015 the issue posed was whether there has to be restriction on the manner in which the media is reporting the court proceedings the comments by the judges the arguments the exasperations the expression of disgust anger all those things get reported things which happen in court during deliberations get reported and somebody said that there has to be a restriction even on that kind of reporting we know that the contempt of court act clearly says that there can be a fair and accurate reporting of court proceedings which is not contempt there can be a fair criticism of the judgment which again is not contempt this is a scheme of the contempt of court act this is the reason why ideally an interference in media's freedom to report the proceedings correctly and fairly should not be subjected to any kind of judicial interdiction that is something guaranteed under article 191 though not specifically by calling it as press freedom as it happens in the united states of america but even dr ambedkar said that the press in india doesn't have any special freedom but we all know that the citizens have the freedom and as the mouth as the ears as the eyes of the public at large the press is given that freedom which has to be essentially protected the problem arises when the press crosses the boundaries of freedom and starts adjudicating things therefore there has to be there what is the impact of the uh, media becoming the prosecutor and the adjudicator somebody's privacy is violated somebody's reputation is infringed and even in tiny cases small cases local cases this has become a kind of tendency which even has an impact on the local judiciary such a serious issue has been snowballing in recent times yeah serious study was conducted by a scholar namely mr v v l n shastri of walden university he said i am again quoting quote influence of trial by media on the criminal justice system in india is the is the title of the study he says that many lawyers whom he interviewed believed that there were instances where judges even altered the judgment due to the influence of the media and were caught intensive case analysis by media before completion of the legal process impacted the judgment 
he further said quote for a long time india's criminal justice system has remained unenthusiastic about allowing unfettered media access to their functions and deliberations unquote therefore it is rather clear that it is high time that there has to be some regulatory mechanism on media trade in the famous judgment in sahara the supreme court said there cannot be any external regulation but there can only be an internal regulation self restraint self regulation can only be the can be the only regulation as far as media is concerned even in the context of trial by the media i agree in principle probably we all would like to agree to this proposition in principle because we all stand for media freedom freedom of the press there is no doubt about it but the point is when it reaches or rather when it breaks all the permissible limits and when media trial it itself intrinsically poses fundamental right violations issues how that will have to be dealt with is a very very complex but a very real issue i would suggest two three things and with that i would conclude this short intervention first of all we have the uh, cable television statute and statutory rules we promulgated in the it in the year 1994 as an ordinance first and then as a, an enactment that is why we find the rules of 1994 and the act of 1995 act the in fact the ordinance preceded the act and it may appear at the first blush that the rules also preceded the act which cannot directly generally happen and the act i should say has certain provisions we know that section 5 of the uh, cable television networks regulation act of 1995 talks about the program code and section 6 talks about the advertisement code and as i said we have the cable television network rules regula uh, regulatory rules of 1994 which expands the idea of program code according to rule 6 of the rules of 1994 offense against good taste and decency is something prohibited something impermissible rule 6 a says about it then rule 6 c attack on religions and communities 6 d talks about the uh, telecast or programs which contain something obscene defamatory false or suggestive innuendos or even half truths though the word media trial is not occurring in rule 6 i think that these provisions and there are further provisions for example rule 6e encouraging or inciting violence then rule 6f is very very important rule 6f says that a program that telecasts something some material some content which is intrinsically contemptuous of court i submit that any instance of trial by the media is an instance of contempt of court doctrinally and very often practically as well so if you imaginatively expand rule 6f of the rules of 1994 i submit that there is no requirement of a new legislation on the topic but a sensible intelligent and practical use of rule 6c by the appropriate authority as and we say is under the act and the rules and by the subsequent notifications would ensure 
proper rule of law in the context of media trade. Then, of course, we are having Rule 6J, which says about propagation of blind beliefs. Beliefs can be convictions. Convictions can be the conviction about the convictions before the actual convictions happening in court. So this is the scheme of the existing rule. And there is a provision, Rule 6K, which says, which bans the derogatory depictions on women. I leave it to my young friends and others here to apply Rule 6K in the modern context where even film stars or other women or ordinary women or celebrity women are all subjected to media trail. I don't want to go into further details of that because we are in a rather in an academic discussion. So it suffices to say that there are existing provisions in the, in the cable television rules of 1990, 1994, which cast a duty on the authorities. And that has a very decentralized platform as well. The authorized officer starts from the, uh, the collectors, the RDOs, at the district level. The executive magistrates at the district level can act. There are punishment, there is uh, ample punishment prescribed. There are other powers also with respect to the seizure as given in section 11 of the act of 1995 power to confiscate as given in section 12 of the act of 1995. Then section 16 says, when there is a contravention of the provisions of the act, which will include when there is contravention of the program code, like the advertisement code, when there is a contravention of the program code, there could that could attract punishment under section 16 and 17. Section 16 talks about punishment for contradiction of the provisions of the act in general, which necessarily includes section 5, read with rule 6 of the rules. Therefore, what follows is when there is a violation, when there is a breach of the program code in any manner whatsoever, including by committing contempt, by an excessive enthusiasm to try the matter through the television, by the television anger or by others, by way of uh, the channel, or even by way of a newspaper, that attracts Section 16, which talks about punishment, heavy punishment, called two years of imprisonment or, or fine or both. When the offense is repeated, there is an enhanced punishment going by section 16, namely five years of imprisonment and fine. Fine is a meager amount, like 1,000 rupees, 5,000 rupees only. But fact remains that at least conceptually, we have a, a regulatory mechanism. Whether the punishment should be enhanced is a it could be a matter of debate where we may have different perceptions. It is not as if there is a, there is a total vacuum to deal with the, the issue of trial by the media. I submit that there are existing statute and statutory rules and there are existing penal provisions, the adequacy of which may be sometimes debatable, but at the same time, no one can say that there is a total vacuum in this area. The problem, in my view, is that the authorities are not vigilant. The public at large are not vigilant. Therefore, it happens that the media trail uh, gets uh, unchecked. Sometimes the hate speech also gets unchecked.
to conclude what we require along with the legal legal mechanism to deal with the issue is to have a public awareness with the public is the consumers of justice the consumers of news the consumers of programs they should have therefore that democratic authority as consumers over the media so whether it is a hate speech or a trial by the media it has a dignity diminishing effect it also infringes the right to equal concern and respect the phrase which dorkin famously uses repeatedly unlike the us doesn't have a hate speech law or a trial by the media law whereas we find in canada there is a law we are somewhere in between the act of 1995 and the rules as i said do not specifically deal with media trial but if there is a system which imaginatively uses the provisions if there is a, an alert public which uh, who are capable of placing it before the appropriate authorities in time and if we are able to adjudge the activities of the media if our business uh, establishments are strong enough are determined enough to boycott the media which indulges which involves in hate speech and trial by the media and this warmongering and all then there is some rays of hope left this is required public vigilance is required apart from strengthening both structurally and functionally strengthening the existing cable television network act so there is a requirement of legal reforms on the one, one side there is also a requirement of continuing legal education and enlightening the public and the institutions and the bureaucrats on the other side i am having optimism in this regard though the issue is extremely serious and it poses threat to the liberty of each and every one of us but we shall be able to overcome that because we have the sense of vigilance even during the darkest period through which we are now passing thank you so much thank you uh, so much kalishwaram raj ji for that talk i'm sure uh, uh, all of us would be benefiting from your wisdom and your knowledge uh, before we take up questions uh, i would like to invite uh, satyaprakash sir to deliver his talk uh, first and then we would eventually move on to the question and answer round about speaking about satyaprakash sir uh, he is uh, someone uh, who likes to define himself as uh, someone who translates law into journalism and uh, he has headed the legal bureau of the indian uh, of the india's uh, premier vice service that is the pti and so is currently working as the uh, legal editor of the he was working as a legal editor of the hindustan times and now currently is working as a legal editor of the tribune and so has completed his uh, bachelor's of law from uh, campus center delhi university and then he went on to pursue his ma from uh, ma in mass communication from guru uh, jableshwar uh, university of uh, science and technology which is in hisar and uh, sir has also been a media trainer and a mentor at uh, who road safety media fellowship in uh, india 2019 sir has also been a jury member of the who road safety media fellowship and so was engaged with the who to conduct a workshop and the training uh, of the journalist uh, writing on road safety uh, issues in 2013 apart from this sir has also been invited to speak at various uh, uh, conferences and seminars naming a few of them so has been invited to speak at the manipur high court on uh, its fifth anniversary celebration to deliver lecture to the judges advocates and journalists on the 30th of uh, april uh, on uh, on the topic uh, which i just mentioned about uh, then so i was also invited uh, to address a seminar on the electoral reforms in india at the faculty of law jamia millia islamia university new delhi and so I was also invited uh, to address a national seminar on the indian languages in the province of law and justice organized by the faculty of law allahabad university 
Uh, sir has also been uh, awarded with uh, several uh, prestigious awards and naming uh, a few of them. Uh, sir has received the Ladley Media and Advertising Award for Gender Sensitivity for the, in the year 2012 and 13. And sir has also been awarded the Dr. Shankar Dayal Trophy on Human Rights by the then Chief Justice of India, Justice B.M. Kripal, in March 2002. I invite you, sir, and we are thankful for you to be here. Thank you, Karan. Uh, and uh, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Kalispan Balaj, for uh, talking about the issue in such a great detail and uh, about various aspects of the problem we are facing today. Uh, thank you, Gopika, for inviting me for this uh, webinar on trial by media issue challenges and the road ahead. I'm grateful to the uh, advocates, the MP Govindan Narayan and Nambia Foundation for this invitation. And I'm deeply inspired by uh, the way you talked about uh, Mr. Nambia and his work, and rather the passion for work. The topic we are discussing today, it, uh, because of some recent developments, it's in news across India and maybe in some foreign countries also, despite the US presidential election, it's being discussed. I'll. Uh, uh, the time is short. I'll try to finish within the uh, given time frame. Uh, but before I start, just a couple of basic uh, premises. Uh, that is, throughout the history, there have been broadly three kinds of systems under which the countries across the globe have been ruled. Monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. Under monarchy, the problem was it would essentially turn into tyranny and dictatorship. Monarch is all pervasive, all powerful, and nobody can speak against him. Aristocracy, the problem was that it would essentially descend into oligarchy. And again, a group of people will control all power and nobody can disturb them. So uh, in the recent, uh, say in the last almost one century, uh, Various countries across the globe, they are trying to experiment with what is known as democracy. Uh, democracy is a system which functions through institutions. And uh, institutions which are uh, the various tools that have been used to keep them under checks. And the system of checks and balances, you uh, assign certain powers to some institutions, then give certain other powers to other institutions and build it in such a manner that one checks the other and the purpose is to ensure that you and I, the citizens, we, we have the larger space available for freedom. So the purpose is, unlike the previous two systems, the democracy, the best part is, it allows all of us to have larger say in the system and we can, uh, nobody could have uh, criticized in good old days, the monarch or the oligarch, but today, you can criticize the prime minister or president of India. So this freedom comes because of democracy, which functions through institutions, institutions which are built on the premise of checks and balances. I'm not getting into the other tools, rule of law and uh, separation of powers. No. The larger thing is that it is based on checks and balances and through institutions. Then the problem with democracy is if the system of checks and balances, it collapses or there are some problems with the system of checks and balances, it will most likely be sent into a chaos. What we are witnessing today is not exactly chaos, but uh, some sort of chaos or maybe the degree is not that high, but what we are witnessing is chaos and those who designed the system of democracy or rather when it evolved and then we tried to crystallize it in the form of our constitution. Uh, the founding fathers, they were pretty aware of this. And so uh, the constitution provides for various checks and balances. The question is how good the system is functioning. And it would depend upon, as Dr. Ambedkar said, who are the people who are running this? The best of the systems given to the worst of the people will not run well. And Worst of the systems, even if the person who is running the system is good, maybe the person can still handle it properly. 
The second is in any system, and I'm talking about democracy over here, in any system, there are certain non-negotiables without which the system cannot function. In democracy, I'm talking about just two of the uh, non-negotiables because the two are concerned over here. And we are talking about that. One is that freedom of press. Freedom of press is a non-negotiable in a democracy. There cannot be any compromise on this. And similar is the case with independence of judiciary. Without an independent judiciary, it's very difficult for a democracy to survive. Uh, because uh, if you get into constitutionalism, political constitutionalism builds the larger uh, you know, design of the constitutional setup, separation of power, building various institutions, checks and balances. But the second part, legal constitutionalism, it's about ensuring that individual rights are not trampled upon. If there are some difficulty, despite the political constitutionalism based on a system of checks and balances, if individual rights are trampled upon, the judiciary will step in and protect the fundamental rights. So the second part is independence of judiciary. So my point is in democracy, both these institutions, the media and, in the, and, and independent judiciary, both are very, very important. Both are very vital to ensure that democracy functions. Before I take it uh, forward, just two, three sentences about the role of media and role of judiciary. The role of media is uh, generally, we say, its role is to inform, to educate, to entertain, to set the agenda for debate and discussion with society, to work as a watchdog for democracy. And in the process, it works as a sort of interface between the society and the state system. Whatever is happening in the society, it will show it to the state. And whatever is happening within the state system, it will show it to the uh, society. And the system is such that one will take the correctional measure about the other and vice versa. Supposing there are some problems in the state system, media is showing it to the society. And because of the pressure which is built because of the democratic system, the state will correct it. Supposing there are some problems in the society, the state will take correctional measures. And this is how the system works. The second part, the role of the judiciary. The role of the judiciary is to uh, dispense justice, to act as a sort of uh, arbiter for any kind of dispute between two parties and the other party could be even a state. So independence of judiciary is important and independence of media is also important and both have very vital role to play. Both together, they have done wonders. And there are many cases in which media will report something, the judges will take so much of and PI initiated, and then lots of things have been done and there are many scams on which based on media reports, the Supreme Court or the High Court, so in many cases, various constitutional courts, they have taken action and they have done wonderful job. So there was a convergence between two institutions. Why? Because they wanted to exercise checks and balances about the other could be executed for the legislature. This problem starts when we get into the conflict zone, where media and judiciary, they appear to be uh, you know, uh, getting into conflict. And why it's happening is because of the nature of the two institutions. Media by nature, it's free. They are much more vocal. And by and large, uh, I'm saying this with great responsibility, by and large, they have done their job fairly well. Why? Because if media is despised by the political system, the state, if media is despised by the judiciary, media is despised by uh, maybe certain sections of the society which are considered to be very powerful, it means they are doing their job pretty well. If the state is loving them and they are darling of the state, it means they have been compromised. So I, I would presume that by and large media is performing its function. But when it comes to uh, the judiciary and the media, 
the relationship uh, gets sour because of the fact that media, when it exercises its uh, see its powers, whatever they have, uh, and uh, they start acting as watchdog, and even about judiciary, they criticize judiciary for certain maybe certain decisions on the administrative side or the judicial side. But they will not be liked by the judges. The problem is that we have an open court system. Section three twenty seven of the CRPC talks about open trial, where media is allowed to enter. Uh, Mr. Kalishwan Raj would know that in the Supreme Court there is a system of accreditation for journalists. We are all invited there. We are given a huge, um, uh, there is huge space given to the media with all sorts of facilities where we go sit. And there was uh, a time when we used to be given a uh, cyclist style copy of Supreme Court verdicts till the time it was not online. So, and why? Because when because we are acting as a sort of interface between the judiciary and the rest of the society we are acting on behalf of judges and taking their judgments to the people and we are doing a sort of legal literacy for them and we are generating awareness in the society so uh, the problem begins where the journalists they start their job as a much and then, because judges are used to live in their comfort zone, journalists are not. So if you encounter a journalist, you will generally say, as Mr. Kalishman Raj said, uh, he must have seen me in the Supreme Court uh, running here and there. And this is how the journalists work. They are comfortable sitting with uh, uh, Chaya at some dhaba, or maybe they are flying with the president on some foreign trip. They are comfortable in all sorts of situations. And they're pretty sure about their job. They're not enjoying the journey. They are always thinking about the stories. The role where the conflict zone begins is when they start reporting matters where the judiciary thinks that they are disturbing their work. Uh, there is a, a law commission of India report, report number 200 on uh, media trial. Mm -hmm. It has said so many things. And there is one uh, lecture by Benjamin Cordozo, US Supreme Court judge, uh, Nature of Judicial Process. No judge is immune to any pressure, and particularly media pressure. Judges are all human beings. Sometimes, even during lunch break, they watch television and they come back and say something that this, this is not acceptable or this is right or wrong. In the evening also, I'm sure they must be watching newspaper and uh, watching a TV channel. And in the evening, uh, in the morning, they must be reading newspapers. This is not to suggest that media has a right to misreport. Media uh, uh, has a right to report. And they, like judges, they also have a sort of, a, they have a right to uh, to be right to claim certain degree of immunity even for misreporting because somebody might commit some mistake because of the presence judges do commit mistake lawyers do and uh, anybody can commit mistakes the only thing is is it intentional it is deliberate is it because of some uh, sort of motivation by and large the uh, discourse regarding media trial has been very very lopsided because not many people know the role of media in the society. When I so, say no, simply people think that media is reporting things and they are reading. Media has a very, very vital role to play. And when I say that we act as watchdog, we take our job very seriously. Uh, there are many cases in which you can say uh, that uh, the so-called fair trial is not fair. And so-called media trial is the real fair trial. Because even in the recent case of uh, Sushant Singh murder or uh, uh, mysterious death case, after all this hullabala, finally the Supreme Court ordered CBI probe. Why? 
because they found that there was something amiss. There was two, three deaths which took place in Mumbai and there was some connection which the courts suspected. So court not just authorized the CBI to probe Sushant Singh, murder, uh, Sushant Singh Rajput murder case, but also give it liberty to investigate any other death that has occurred in connection with that. Why? Because the judges are very intelligent. They understand things. So what is given to us to understand as a journalist, I will not take it on the face value. I have my own common sense. I have my own sixth sense. Supposing I am a crime reporter, I have been to various crime scenes. So in very first, at the very first glance, I can say that there is something amiss. And the police are trying to, you know, somehow um, hush up the matter. So uh, media trial, by and large, is a misnomer. There is no media trial. Has the media sent somebody to jail? The only thing is creating a perception of guilt that yes, this is the man or woman who has committed the crime. That is where in some cases and some TV channels, I'm not naming any, they have crossed the line. Uh, so far as print is concerned, nobody uh, writes in such manner because the institution of print journalism is pretty old. So by uh, uh, because it's pretty old, so it has got institutionalized. The functioning has got institutionalized, and there are various levels of checks and balances. And people who are there, they are pretty uh, uh, good people. Uh, television industry. One of the problems is that uh, it has expanded very fast in a very short span of time. We have around 450 or maybe 500 24 7 TV channels, and we may not have that many good professionals or trained professionals to man the ch TV channels. So there are lapses which are bound to happen. But are those lapses uh, intentional? Uh, in most cases, I will say no. But I will point to uh, another serious problem on the part of the media. Uh, that is the contradiction in their revenue model. Media is considered to be the fourth stage. But this fourth estate is also uh, a business venture. The other three estates are not a business venture. They are not. But media is also a business venture. So at times, there could be cases where uh, uh, this media as a business venture and media as fourth estate, uh, there could be some contradictions which can play out. And uh, there could be issues relating to that. Uh, so far as uh, the challenges are concerned, uh, one of the most important challenges is as a civilized society, we must have civilized discourse. This is what the Supreme Court uh, pointed out recently, that uh, the level of discourse has gone down. And uh, I'm not saying it can be tackled by law, as suggested by Mr. Kaliswaram Raj. Because as lawyers and many judges, they, are, uh, they, are, they have misconception that every problem has a legal solution. That's that very precise, this, this premise is thoroughly wrong. There cannot be legal solution to every problem. The judges have tried legal solution for umpteen number of problems and they have miserably failed because of the lack of expertise. And law is not answer to every problem. So uh, there are some certain things which can best be left to the industry itself. And uh, because else you will end up uh, having a very, very legalistic society where the judges and lawyers, they are only can survive. The rest of the people will be victims and nothing else. So I'm not suggesting a creation of a very legalistic society. There are certain areas, like I say, uh, each profession has its own uh, organization. Uh, which will uh, look after, uh, uh, for, uh, which will oversee the ethical aspect of uh, that profession. Bar Council of India regulates uh, uh, the legal profession. Uh, similar is the case with uh, many other profession. Press Council of India is there for uh, print and uh, agency journalism. That's a different thing that it's a you know, toothless body. But to suggest that every problem can be tackled by law, that itself is wrong. 
The second, I don't agree with uh, Mr. Kaliswan Raj's suggestion that uh, the uh, Cable TV Network Regulation Act and the rules can be extended to deal with this. Uh, I, again, why? Because uh, Cable TV Regulation Act and even the rules, they're thoroughly misconceived set of uh, norms because they put the entire onus on the cable TV operator. Operator is not doing, is not doing anything. The content is generated by somebody else. So he is just a middleman through whom the content is reaching my home. One. Second is, we are living in the age of OTT, over the top. So cable TV is not the solution. I am getting news directly in my phone at any point in time. So that cannot be the solution because here there is a huge gap between law and technology. And law is lagging behind like anything. And this gap is getting widened day by day because of the policy paralysis on the part of the executive and the legislature. And this has been happening right since 90s. The Supreme Court's verdict in uh, the Information and Broadcasting, Secretary Information and Broadcasting Ministry versus Cricket Association of Bengal, they had pointed out to it. And since then, uh, and thereafter, this uh, Cable TV Network Regulation Act was enacted. But then, the technology is changing very fast. Law is not changing, and this gap. I am not suggesting that this can be complete. This gap can be completely bridged. This gap will remain because of the nature of technology, which changes very fast. Um, uh, those uh, many of you, uh, Gopika and uh, uh, Karan, uh, you must be born in the 90s. Uh, in the early 90s, when I landed in Delhi, we used to call, um, uh, talk to our parents using a telephone booth. That was very common uh, sight in Delhi or uh, uh, most of these uh, towns. It's vanished because the technology changed and then uh, within years it was gone. So it's very difficult to gap, uh, bridge this gap, but still there has to be some effort on the part of the legislature and the executive. There is none. And, uh, and that is why uh, the, uh, if you go to KDSAT, the entire telecom sector, Despite TRI recommendations, many of the areas, the problem is the gap between law and technology. Uh, third is uh, the when we, it comes to regulation, uh, there are people who suggest that government must regulate it. There was a suggestion from uh, uh, Justice Markande Karju, who was the Press Council of India chairperson way back in sometime in 2012. Uh, he wrote to the then Information and Broadcasting Minister Manish Tiwari that the ambit and the jurisdiction of Press Council of India should be expanded and uh, the television industry and even the social media should be brought under its ambit. The letter must be gathering dust in uh, the, long, uh, the Information and Broadcasting Ministry. But uh, I'm not saying what uh, Justice Kartu suggested was right, but there has to be some regulator for the industry television industry, because what the government did, it put the cart before the horse. It allowed the television industry to expand without putting in place necessary regulatory mechanism. Today, if you, if the government has to take action against any television channel, they has to resort to the licensing condition. Because there is no other uh, provision of law for the government to take action. If there was a regulatory mechanism, the regulator would have stepped in and uh, taken corrective measures, which is not fair. So uh, the issue of government regulation, generally the industry uh, opposes it. Why? Because of their own uh, uh, experience with the government. And the government, if you allow the government, it's like uh, judiciary would not allow the government to get into judicial appointments. Judicial appointment, the moment government says something or tries to do something, judicial independence is under threat. Similar is the case with the media. The moment the government tries to do something, the bogey of 1975 emergency is raised. And uh, the government, come, all, automatically it will be on the back foot. So the government has completely left the industry to regulate itself. Right, wrong, or whatever. The government is completely away from it. They are saying, unless and until there are some extreme cases where they are forced to um, 
um, use the licensing conditions to take some action against them, some TV channels. The second is the issue of self-regulation, because the industry says uh, we are for self-regulation. There is nothing wrong with self-regulation. The only uh, thing is self-regulation is for a highly evolved set of people. It's not for every. So uh, the people who are in the industry, uh, I suspect barring a few, they have not <clears throat> risen to that level where self-regulation uh, can be prescribed and can work well. There is a buyer media and buyer media is uh, that uh, even the self-regulatory mechanism can be given a statutory backing. But my suggestion would be, because if you give uh, a statutory backing to the self-regulatory mechanism, those who are sitting as regulators, they will have some power to take action. It's unless it's like uh, Austinian thing. Law is law is um, commanded the sovereign backed by sanction. So without sanction, nothing would work. So even the self-regulatory body has to be given some power to uh, regulate the industry and enforce certain things. Unless you give that power to the regulator or self-regulator, nothing would work. But my suggestion would be if you keep the government completely out, like the case is with the judicial appointments. Here also you will face problems because the government, which they fail to achieve directly through NJAC, they are achieving indirectly through by sitting over certain appointments, recommendations of the collegium. Theoretically speaking, uh, uh, the judges might be happy that we have secured the independence of judiciary, which is uh, uh, thoroughly wrong uh, because uh, uh, way back uh, in 2008-9, Mr. Hansraj Bhadwaj, who was the law minister, uh, now he's no more, he said uh, the collegium system is a system of give and take. So give and take still works. The only thing is that judges uh, can claim that we are completely independent. And uh, uh, while the fact is that under the current system, the, the quality of appointments has gone down and uh, we are facing problems in the judiciary in terms of the quality of judges. Similar is the case with media. If you do, the moment government talks about uh, regulation, the media will raise the bogey of independence of media. And hence the government has left it and then you can see the, what is the condition of the media. The ideal situation would be, the best would be if the self-regulatory mechanism is given a statutory backing with at least one government representative being there. Because the government is a necessary stakeholder. To say that government is nobody, which is not acceptable, government is somebody. And government is part of the system. And uh, if you don't, then you will face the kind of problems the judges are facing, collegium is facing. They will recommend something and they will say, recommend this. You can do whatever you feel like. The system, at some level, there has to be some degree of trust between the uh, individuals who are running the system at top. And those who think that uh, everything is has to be in writing, Britain has a system, they don't have a written constitution. British Constitution is, uh, you know, it evolved since uh, Magna Carta until date. There have been many landmarks. There are various uh, statutes, conventions, and judicial pronouncements. And their system is still running. And I suspect better than ours. Because those who are running the system, it requires certain degree of intellectual honesty. If you have that, you can run it. If you don't have that, it will always be very difficult to run it. Uh, the last point is about uh, the ethical conduct uh, of journalists. Uh, there could be cases where, knowing fully well, a journalist runs a story or runs a story in a particular manner just to fetch TRP. Uh, this is not something which can be dealt with by law. I am 
all for law but law has limitation and laws cannot regulate anything we can't have a system like west where law now laws are regulating relationship between parents and toddlers uh, we know uh, some cases where uh, 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 an indian um, child was taken away from uh, the, uh, her parents and uh, or his parents and the uh, parents were shocked because they had shouted at the child or something of this sort a friend of mine uh, who was living in washington his daughter somehow uh, called up he said something to his daughter daughter called up or there is some particular number where uh, the help comes and the, immediately the police came and he was embarrassed there was nothing uh, no action taken nothing but uh, it happens so we cannot take it to that is extreme where the law enters areas where they should not be and the law starts regulating everything then it's the end of the system it's like uh, we have our constitution the provides for president shall appoint the prime minister but who shall be appointed it's not mentioned so if you write that thereafter you write this or you write that you will end up the entire constitution will be dealing with the appointment of the prime minister and the cabinet itself certain degree of trust is required and without that trust and intellectual honesty no system is going to work what is needed is uh, that trust to be built and it can be built and that intellectual honesty can be inculcated because through uh, certain kinds of trainings and institutional trainings even within the media uh, media organizations they need to come forward and uh, those who are uh, making money from the system they need to invest in uh, training journalists training in the uh, they need to be trained in the certain legal aspects of journalism ethical aspects of journalism apart from what is uh, how do we write a story how do you report a story and how far we can go in a story that's all fine but certain legal aspects of uh, journalism ethical aspects of journalism it's needed and uh, uh, society needs to be a uh, patient because democracy by nature is it's chaotic if you uh, give telephone uh, give mobile phones to maybe a billion people with uh, free data or per day where they are free to access uh, social media and other forms of media and they are also uh, uploading videos and audios and everybody is journalist so if you end if you want to regulate so you will not have that many people to regulate it will be end of the system so uh, first is we need to learn to live with this kind of chaos because we have chosen to be a democracy or we can become china or uh, north korea where uh, you will have you will it will you will not have this kind of chaos it will be very peaceful but that peace will be uh, of a completely different kind with this note i take uh, leave and i thank uh, uh, karan gopika and the namya foundation for giving this uh, opportunity to me because uh, i happen to teach media law and um, i also teach constitutional law and comparative constitution so uh, media in particular because i am a trained lawyer i am a trained journalist so i generally if uh, i happen get an opportunity to speak on any issue relating to media i am not touching upon uh, the contempt law contempt law is one of the worst laws in india the rest of the world is moving ahead and uh, it is being misused like anything in many cases it has been misused against a judge and uh, giving all procedural things like judges high court judges they are given uh, uh, t- security of training and they can be removed only uh, by parliament and supreme court virtually removed a judge of the kolkata high court by a judicial order so all sorts of checks and balances gone for a toss so it depends upon who is exercising power for what purpose 
the maturity requires that even in greatest provocation, you need to stick to the rule book. And after having passed the order, they realized that uh, uh, there was something wrong. So uh, uh, the judge was not arrested till the time he retired. So uh, even judges, sometimes they get provoked. And uh, Mr. Raj talked about uh, Sidi Sahara verdict. It is one of the worst verdicts in the history of the Supreme Court. And I'm witness to the entire proceedings. I know the background also. And so I say it's one of the worst verdicts. Where the Supreme Court, the judge's job and the constitutional court's job is to enlarge the space, the space for freedom. There was no provocation for the Supreme Court for passing this order at all. Why did they pass the order? I, I, the audience should know. There was a letter written by a lawyer to another lawyer and that was leaked to the press. That's it. The journalists, on a daily basis, we access communication, government communication or communication which matters to the people, particularly important cases. We publish it on a daily basis, even today. The moment affidavit is filed in the Supreme Court, we report it. What is wrong with it? And uh, the Supreme Court, when Justice Kapadia set up a bench, constitutional bench, and then uh, this uh, postponement of reporting order was passed. I don't think it's being followed anywhere in this country. Because he imported some American concept and tried to impose it on us. Our constitution is very clear. Article 19.1a and 19.2. The framework does not provide for pre-censorship at all. It does not. And in 1950, immediately after the constitution came into force, the two cases, one is uh, um, Brisbane versus state of Delhi and Romesh Thapar versus state of Madras. In both these cases, the judges, they took very strong stand and they protected media freedom. So if the judges were so strong in 1950, that forced even Nehru government to go for first amendment and to strengthen the restriction clause of the constitution, article 19.2. Whatever you find in 19.2, much of it was added by the first amendment. And then a couple of expressions in 1963, um, 16th amendment. Why? Because not many people understand that uh, media freedom is very, very vital for us. Because most of the times you will find, I'm not saying all the time they are reporting properly, but it's like if you have a problem in your left hand, instead of treating that problem, you cannot chop it off. So media cannot be gagged. Media has to be allowed to function properly. The only thing is the areas where they are getting it wrong, that has to be corrected. And for that, you need institutional mechanism. Prescribing punishment for one case or the other and putting behind bar one or two journalists is not the solution. It is not going to solve the problem. It requires institutional response. And institutional response can be from the government. It can be from the industry. It can be even from the uh, judiciary. And unless you have institutional response to this problem, this is not going to be solved. Thank you very much again. And uh, I have uh, uh, taken too much time. I hope uh, uh, the topic, I have done justice to the topic. But uh, uh, the topic is such that even if you speak for two, three hours, uh, there will be something left out. So thank you very much. And uh, back to you, Karan. Thank you so much, uh, Satya Prakasha. And uh, it was really insightful to hear you again. Uh, now I may please invite uh, Gopika uh, for her uh, remarks. Thank you so much, uh, Kali Shrimrad sir and Satya Prakash sir for, the, for that enlightening discussion. And uh, I think it was, it was the perfect balance that we had because we had somebody representing the legal fraternity and we had some, somebody representing the media as well. So we got to hear both uh, you know, these opinions. And uh, thank you very much uh, for accepting our invitation and being here today. And uh, secondly, thank you for everyone who've uh, tuned in both on YouTube and on Zoom. Uh, that too on a Saturday evening. Uh, so thank you so much. And thank you to Karan and his entire team of Rotract uh, for all the uh, help and, and the cooperation. 
and we look forward to uh, hosting many more such webinars and other intellectual discussions in future thank you so much thank you thank you uh, thank you everyone for joining and uh, i hope it was a great learning session for everyone so we can just log off from the meeting now thank you thank you sir